everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Kill Lloyd with Trees Off. Uh, I am not Bill Egan. We'll be up here uh, pretty quickly, pretty soon, uh, after I tell you a little bit of housekeeping stuff. One, uh, we have another webinar coming up in November with uh, Dave Anderson. Uh, he's going to be talking about finding a rainforest, uh, talking a little bit about his foundation he's got. Um, which is really neat, and um, some bird science, probably. Uh, if you have any questions during tonight's webinar with Joe, go ahead and put them into the chat, wherever you are, and I'll do more Facebook, and I'll ask him. Um, he knows a lot about our culture. He's been doing this for a long time. Uh, he's from, um, can I, can you see me now? Okay, um, he knows a lot about everything that is art culture related, whether or not it is um, based on his object training um, or his work with the historical society that he is the president of. Hold on one second, I'll get this a little bit louder for you guys. Is that better? That's better. I was trying to keep it not too loud since my days uh, being in nerd New York room. So, uh, check that out right now on TrueStuff.com. We have, uh, you can get the Notch Fusion Emerald Brand for free with code free SRT on any or over $500. If you're not signed up for our email, you can do that at the bottom of the TrueStuff page. Um, do that because we also have things that we have, uh, that we, a promotion that we only send to our email list. Uh, check us out on Instagram. There's always a lot of cool things that we're doing there. Um, just in general, uh, keep watching what we're doing as we're trying to put a lot of educational content out and uh, a lot of fun contests will be coming up. The gear guide is out right now. If you don't have it, you can request it uh, after you stuff. Um, we work really hard on that, and uh, I think it's pretty neat. So without further ado, I'm going to head over to Joe Aiden. I am talking and using the whole control with board thingy here. And show. Well, hey, Kale, thank you. Um, obviously, no snags just yet. Um, I just want to say thank you guys for having me on there. I'm not sure if Nick's going to jump on, but thank you, Nick, uh, Kale, and the rest of uh, Team Tree Stuff for having me again. I think it's been 2019 uh, was the last time that I've been on one of the uh, – the webinars, and we did talk about history then. We talked about a lot of other things in the past. Um, again, I'm Joe Aiken. I'm the senior tech rep with ArborJet. Uh, I've been with the company going on almost 20 years. And uh, I'm also a former board member of ISA and all that fun stuff. But currently, I'm the president of the Arbor Culture Society of Michigan Foundation, which is a foundation that we started to assist the industry from outside the industry and within that we created the history of arbor culture and when we get near the end of the presentation tonight i kind of show you what we've been doing and um why we're doing it and uh we'll talk about a lot of good things so when we were in 2019 we spent a lot more time on climbing equipment and ropes and saddles and saws and don't get me wrong, that stuff, I'm very excited about that, that stuff too. Um, but I wanted to spend more time on the other side of the fence of arbor culture. Uh, for those that may not climb, and even for those that do climb, understanding everything about arbor culture just makes you a more well-rounded arborist. So hopefully some of the history on why I love what I do and why I do it can kind of, uh, through osmosis, get you guys excited about it also. And I'll try not to use guys all the time because I know there's ladies out in the crowd too. So uh, so all the tree peeps that are with us tonight, um, let's get started. So technically, I got History of Arbor Culture 101, but since we already had 101, this should actually be 102. But a potato, potato. Uh, let's get rolling. So, um, I think there's a lot of reasons why we need to understand the history of the industry that we serve. 
and, and one of the the most important thing is that tree care isn't new. Uh, it it, it date I get it date backs over two thousand years, but it actually dates back uh, through archives and stuff like that. It dates back well be well before written um, history was ever being documented. So you could actually, if you looked on care and movement of trees, you can go back five thousand years. So um, they're all they're, all these facts are documented. Uh, the origins of our basis uh, in early years was certain that people love trees. Uh, and you think about back in the uh, pre-modern arbor culture days, it was more for food, shelter, and worship. Uh, so it's very important to know. And one of the, the key factors that makes uh, understanding the history of our industry is that hopefully we don't repeat the bad stuff. And that's not just arbor culture, urban forestry, tree, you know, tree surgery, however we want to, you know, sum it up. But that's pretty much in life. Uh, understand history, understand what happens, how it happened. Let's try not to make the same mistake twice. So a little bit of quick notes. Um, obviously because back in the pilgrim days, and you go back to the Santa Maria, Pinta, and Nina, I think I got them all. Street, Street. I might have remembered something from history class back in uh, junior high. <clears throat> Most of what we know in modern arbor culture came, originates in Europe. Uh, obviously, they've been doing it a lot longer than we have. There's a lot of stuff now that's going back and forth over the pond. So it's really exciting to understand that we're actually continuing the heritage of our forefathers uh, by practicing uh, arbor culture. Uh, it's always been creating, it's kind of been creating as a science as we go through the years. And uh, we'll talk about a lot of the forefathers in this industry that paved the way to create the AKA industry that we serve today. I'll talk a lot about, try not to burp at the microphone, but I'll, we'll talk a lot about MSU Forestry and MSU Forestry Club. And it's only because locally I got very involved with uh, some of the oldest organizations to understand the history of what we do today. Um, one of the neat terms uh, that we use today is tossed around arborist arbor culture. What's interesting to know, that's not always been what we were called. We were tree surgeons, uh, tree artisans, uh, and some of them were even called tree butchers, which we kind of talked about back in the day. If you, you know, before the use of saws and chainsaws, uh, they used chisels and meat cleavers, very similar to the one I got on the back shelf, that was the pruning tools. So the term arbor culture appeared in North America in 1932 by the founder of uh, the company that I used to work for, Chaz F. Irish. So pretty cool stuff uh, that we're going to dig into. Okay, moving on. And what's interesting about tonight is that because um, <laughs> because uh, I couldn't get the presentation to sync to the technology that we're using. Uh, I got to give uh, Kale some, maybe there's a safe word I can say to switch, but Kale's, Kale's in the back the background uh, making sure that we stay on track and that the, the, the slide moves on. So just a couple real quick uh, significant events leaving why we, there's a development of arbor culture. And if you go back to the Columbia voyage, uh, even the HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin, uh, the movement of woody plants to North America from other areas around the world. And why that is very important even today and why there's a lot of inspections and why it's very hard to um, do that is that the introduction of invasive insects and diseases, and it's not just to North America, it's an it's actually a serious issue uh, from North America going elsewhere. So we have to be very careful what we do. This world's getting a lot smaller, and it's a lot easier to travel, and it's also a lot easier to transport invasive insects and diseases from continent to continent. Uh, in the early or the mid 1900s, you got to think about uh, they started planting and all these plants that we were bringing in were put into botanical gardens. Again, 
I just worked on some trees in a Boone County Arboretum down in Kentucky, uh, which was a hardy rubber tree that's not native to North America. And the trees weren't doing well. So we had to figure out why. So we can get more and more into um, some of the plant health care history and why some of the old school techniques is what led to what we had to do with that tree. And then again, another one that's uh, worth noting is Arbor Day. You think about Sterling Morton in Nebraska when he started Arbor Day in the 1870s. It was a recognition of the value of trees. So we've had a value of trees um, for you know hundreds of years and centuries. And I'm proud to say we're taking care of it right now. And uh, what a great industry we get to serve. Uh, let's roll on. Maybe not. Next slide. Okay. I'll take a drink while Kale uh, finds the right button. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna advance mine. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So we got caught up. Thanks, Kale. No big deal. Uh, like I said, this is going to be a really a laid back presentation. I'm a laid back guy. Um, if you guys got questions, please uh, type them in there. We'll hit them as we go. Uh, I just want to make sure that we kind of get through this and we get to answer some questions and spend some time at the end of the presentation to kind of chew on some really cool things. So arboriculture developed into a small business uh, kind of with the beginning of tree research in the 1930s. And there's a couple of serious invasive pests that kind of spurred uh, tree research. Now, don't get me wrong that even back in the day, back in the early 1900s, um, there was you know research. There was great industry innovators and companies that began to push like Davy Bartman and Ashbourne um, were kind of pushing towards the need for uh, a care of plants in the urban landscape. Even back then, it wasn't even urban in uh, forced in situations. It was just tree care. Um, and there's other innovators that I'd like to, I, I think they need credit too. Um, like the Chaz F. Irish. Uh, Chaz F. Irish is one of the founders of NAA, uh, National Arbor Association. Uh, that's the company I got to work for. And I've always been a history buff. And I always, I've done tree care for almost 40 years. It was amazing when I got to work for that company with the rich history. Um, John Hickey, John Hickey on Long Island, an amazing wealth of knowledge and a pioneer in arboriculture. Bob McConnell, Bill Lanfear in Ohio. And if some of these names ring a bell, uh, there's an opportunity if you uh, go on to ISA's uh, bookstore, you can, in 1999, they created uh, a DVD. Do we even use DVDs anymore? I don't know. Maybe we have all passed that. But there's a DVD called The Legends of Arboriculture. If you're interested in the history of arboriculture and hear it from the pioneers themselves, uh, it's well worth the money. And I, I believe me, you won't be disappointed if you pick it up. Ah, so some of the books that I use on a regular basis, um, I pick these books up early on and I got some pictures up there, but I'll kind of hold them up a little bit too, because if you're, if you want to, you want to put some more books into your library, um, obviously this one's on the screen. I got a lot of the information through here, uh, which is Arboriculture, History and Development in North America. Fantastic book. You can find it online. So if you get a chance and you're interested, this is a must-have in your library. Uh, another book that I turn to very frequently, um, you know, and I reach out to ISA, um, reach out to TCIA. You know, there's I got a lot of the historical shade tree digests. Um, is this book? I got it on the screen, but Arborist Equipment, and there's been a few editions, and this is by a good friend of mine, Don Blair. 
what's interesting is that when he talks about the equipment that we use in the beginning of each chapter, he gets into the history of where it came from and why. Again, when we talk about the history, um, another phenomenal book to, um, to have in your library, in your office. So if you don't have it, write that one down too. And again, I put on there the legends of arbor culture. Um, I used to have a handful of copies and I was so excited about it because, you know, it falls right into my wheelhouse that I've lent them out. And since I've lent them out, I have no idea who I lent them out and I don't have a copy. anymore. So I will be looking for uh, another copy. And like I said, most and foremost, uh, I got the thinker in the middle of uh, one photograph is that there needs to be a desire to want to review to think about the history of where we came from and where we're going forward. Because tomorrow's history, yesterday's history, so we need to move forward. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to, I'll, I'll make a point like that. Once I started the museum, uh, it's pretty amazing that how much on a day-to-day -day basis I get stuff in the mail. So this is the Eager Beaver Mac 100 series chainsaw, 1987. Someone thought I should have it. And I appreciate it very much. Um, we do have this saw, but we do not have the owner's manual. So, very cool stuff. And then I got this today. TCI Magazine. Another great resource for you um, in the industry. Do you get the uh, tree stuff gear guide? No. What? No, I didn't. I'm looking around. Believe me, uh, my wife puts all the tree stuff in the shop, and I did not get it. Well, somebody about that. Yeah, you know somebody about that. <laughs> all right, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna move on to a few pioneers that have been really influential um, in the advancement of arbor culture. Now, the very first one that you can't go past is uh, Dr. Alex Shigo. Now, Alex Shigo has um, created some of the most important books in tech pieces on the care of trees that still resonates today as it did through the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, during the heydays of his practice. Uh, the New Tree Dictionary, do I got mine out here? Nope, I don't have mine out here, but that's generally not far away. An amazing resource, um, some of the other books about modern arbor culture. And I think the one quote from Alex Shigo that I probably use more than any other quote, uh, and especially when I get phone calls from uh, the, the public or a, a, a potential customer is that to know a tree, you have to touch a tree. So and the reason I bring that up is that, and why it was so important that when Alex Shigo said that is, we can't understand truly what's going on with the tree unless we're there ourselves and put our hand on it. Um, I know some guys can give, are pretty good at giving uh, ballpark figures on certain uh, practices, but technically, me, I won't do it. I've always stuck to, to know a tree, I have to touch a tree. To, to, to give sound advice, I have to be there and see what's going on. So Alex Shigo is an amazing resource. If you put him in the internet, you know, probably most of you guys have some of his books. Uh, if you don't, uh, some of these are just, again, must-haves that you need to have to have an understanding of the history and terminology, excuse me, and where it came from and who did it. So Alex Shigo, A New Tree Biology, great book. Another less known, uh, very influential and important educator in urban forestry was Dr. Chadwick. Um, I never, well, in the later years with Dr. Chadwick was still coming to the Ohio uh, Tree Care Conference, I got to meet him. Uh, but then I got to know his daughter, Barbara, a little bit better when uh, Dr. Chadwick passed. Uh, 38 years as a professor at the Ohio State University. And he was in the leader in the field of arboriculture for over 60 years. Think about 32 to 93. There's not too much as far as journals, books, 
uh, information on arboriculture that's out there in the early days that wasn't reviewed or written by Dr. Chadwick. So it's a very, um, it's a name that I don't think we should forget when we re review the history of arboriculture. So another great leader that everybody should be aware of. So every time I get a break, I'll take a swig. All right, now here's Chaz F. Irish. And the reason I put this in here, because this is where, again, where I got my, my love of history of arboriculture. Now, Chaz F. Irish started in 1910. So it really wasn't much far, you know, longer after uh, Davy got involved, uh, Francis A. Bartlett, Ashblunt Brothers. Uh, Chaz F. Irish was a pioneer in the industry. And again, uh, he was responsible for the change in title from tree expert, tree surgeon to arborist, which we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, he was the pioneer. Now, there was there's two organizations uh, that still are the guiding bodies of arboriculture, and one is the International Society of Arboriculture, which has been through some name changes. I believe it was the National Shade Tree Conference, and then it was the International Shade Tree Conference for brief time, and then it became the International Society of Arboriculture. The other side was the National Arborist Association, which should have been, but probably isn't, just a little tidbit, should have been on your quiz. But NAA, the National Arborist Association, uh, transitioned into TCIA. Uh, Chaz F. Irish was a key component of that transition. A lot of the products that were developed back in the early 1900s, like the ball cart, if you look at the slide and right in the middle, you can look at the truck that's in the background and you can look at the tree cart. That's a tree moving cart. That cart, that original cart that is in that picture from the early 1900s is actually in my possession, a gift from the Chazep Irish family, along with their entire historic arboriculture library was donated to my nonprofit to be put on display for the public. So I can't thank the family enough, but that original cart that is in that picture in the center is actually in storage right now to be put on display um, at the museum that we're trying to design. Which is also pretty cool as I was looking at that and I went and when they donated the library books. I have one of the books that was actually Chaz's books that I have. I mean, I'm going to kind of pop it up, which I love getting old books. In this book, um, it's just a handbook of trees in North America. So if you look at it, I, I kind of, I'm going to break it open, but I'll, I'm going to show you this in a minute too, but. Let's go back to the date of this book. Now, this was on Chaz's 1924. So 1924, uh, you know, not these, but what was amazing is that I thought was really cool is that in this book, when they found an example, they put the leaf in the book. This book, this, his, this book that was Chaz's book is full of sample leaves that he put in there through his career. So I was very, very excited and very fortunate Hawthorne, uh, to receive this, to put into the library, to share with um, our industry. But when I was digging through there, because we're talking about plant health care, I wanted you guys to kind of see this cool little card. And you probably can't read it, but the neatest thing was, is that when we talk about history, when we talk about things that we do, let me try to hold it still and square, um, this was something from the Irish company that says, keep your trees healthy. Now, when I look at it, it had a schedule. Now, this is even before the Irish company moved an office to Detroit. They had offices in Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago uh, during the early 1900s. And a lot of the, I, I love it, for a complete arboreal service, Call Eddie, 0848. And I, okay, let's zoom in one more time. 
Um, if you look on this tree over here, that says on the bottom, healthy tree. And this is unhealthy tree. So that was, that was on a postcard. It's got all these lists of services. Pruning. But not only the services, which I thought was pretty amazing on this, is that they had, they were, they were relying on the science and they were relying on when to apply each service. So we talk about that a lot today. Um, when and when not to prune. I think Lindsay did a great job on when to prune, when not to prune. Um, when to fertilize, when not to fertilize. Do we use fertilization? So all this stuff was amazing that back in the day, it was already being done. Let's rely on history. Okay. Very cool. I'm very proud to have that. And I'm very proud to have the opportunity to show you guys that too. Um, Michigan State Forestry. Now, Michigan State, again, obviously, I'm from Michigan. So I'm a little biased of the uh, Spartans because, and it's not that I graduated there. It's because I had an opportunity through my career to work with a lot of the professors there and a lot of the research trials that we do uh, within ArborJet. But one of the amazing things are is that Michigan Forestry and Park Association. So we talked earlier about let's look into the history locally. What, what is the history of your association? What is the history of the company that you work for? Who's the oldest tree care company around? So I like doing that. And the, the vast history of forestry and urban forestry at, at Michigan State is immense. So Michigan Forestry and Park Association was started in the the historic part of campus in the forestry building in 1927. Uh, and then that, that, that MFPA is still around, uh, but they have a different tax code and they do different things within Michigan. But then it evolved into the Michigan Arbor Association, to the Arbor Culture Society of Michigan, uh, today is ISA Michigan. And then uh, we have a sister group, the ASM Foundation, me. So there's a lot of local history um, that you can kind of dig into uh, to pique your curiosity of what's actually um, happening in the history around you, in the world around you. Uh, with working with the forestry and the forestry club, if you look at the, uh, the top picture were the horses. Yeah, little cursors going around it. That is on campus. That picture was before automobiles when the foresters were riding horses around Michigan State campus. In the class of 1900, um, I don't have a picture on there, actually donated a big stone horse watering trough for um, the horses on campus. Those are horse foresters. If that's not one of the coolest pictures you ever see, I'm not sure what's going to get you excited about history, but just to know that that one day you're walking to class in the forestry department or whatever, uh, the equestrian department comes galloping by uh, on a horseback is actually pretty amazing. So uh, Michigan State, check out your local state, check out uh, your local extension, check out your local extension will lead you to um, the department. You know, how old has the department been there? Who started it? They're all cool questions and some of you guys want to ask yourself. So now we're going to go into um, the, 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 the pest control side, the, the insects and disease sides for a little bit, because these, um, these insects and diseases that we face, and some of them been around for a long time, have also um, changed the direction of arboriculture, urban forestry. And... Sometimes they were for the good and sometimes they weren't, they were for the worst. And we'll talk about both, both sides. But one of the first major introduced pests, um, and I don't know what came first either. I don't think tussock moth is actually introduced, but that came out. But gypsy moth was the first main pest that came out that really changed the way we look at what we do 
in an urban setting. So Leopold Trevillet in uh, the mid 1860s uh, lived just outside of Boston, brought in gypsy moth from Europe to try to develop a better strain of silk. Um, and after he had him here and he was breeding him and he had a whole greenhouse full of them, a storm hit, break it open a window uh, and released a handful of larva. Well, I don't know if it was larva. It's kind of hard because if you think about the, it could have been whatever time the life cycle of the insect was. They got out into the neighborhood and he, he did his due diligence by telling the authorities that, hey, this is a native, this was in my lab, this got out and believe um, nobody listened until about 20 or 30 years later when it became a really serious threat. And you know what's interesting is that, I don't know if he did it intentionally or not, but uh, he retired and returned to Paris without ever knowing uh, what the catastrophe that he uh, created in the United States. So 1868, that's over 150 years ago. And believe it or not, this is still an insect that we're dealing with on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, this year in Michigan, it, uh, you know, it's ebb and flow, peaks and valley. Um, we hit a really bad last couple of years with gypsy moth. And as it's getting closer and closer to the Detroit metropolitan area, it was so devastating this year that it was actually defoliating evergreens too, which is, they've been known to feed on, but they, they clean off all the deciduous trees, obviously oaks being their preferred host. Um, they had to continue to feed and they were jumping on to blue spruces and all types of pines and evergreens and actually were defoliating. Deciduous trees can relief and can survive, but when that happens to your, your evergreens, they're gone, they're dead, they can't relief. So 150 year old pest and um, we're still dealing with something like that. So that's why very important for us as arborists, um, even if you're not you know, and I think this is a very important point. Even if you're not practicing plant health care on a day-to-day -day base, which I would differ to agree with you because if you're pruning trees, you're practicing plant health care because you're pruning according to an ANSI standard to, to, to maintain the health of the tree. But if you're not doing plant health care and uh, applying compounds to uh, interject insects and diseases, it still should be your responsibility to understand it and be able to understand enough of it that something's going wrong and notify authorities. So it's all of our responsibility. It would be no different than, um, I was a climber for most of my, my um, arboriculture career. It'd be no different than me walking onto a property noticing there was a hazard and not identifying someone with a hazard. It's all of our responsibility for the same thing with an insect. And maybe if we catch it early enough, we can eradicate it before it becomes a problem. And if we take it serious enough, we might be able to, or we can have another gypsy moth, and then we'll never know how long that that's gonna last. So there's kind of a picture of uh, Leopold. Like I said, he, you know, if you look over on the map of the, the state, you can see exactly where north of Boston it happened. It's kind of a timeline. Um, and this is all cyclic. Believe it or not, uh, they had an outbreak back on the Cape in Boston over the last three, four, five years. So it's actually made a circle from ground zero right back to where it originated. It's really not going to go anywhere. There's been some great, um, there's been some great advances in what we do. Um, individual trees in a landscape can be protected very well, but in the forest. Uh, you pretty much have to let Mother Nature take its course. Um, the picture that Kale's showing you now is some of the early plant health care. They used to torch them with kerosene. Um, they didn't know what to do. They were trying all kinds of things. So there, there's them. They got a little torch, and there's the guy uh, with his wand, not nuking everything, all the little eggs and all the little caterpillars, little moths laying on the tree, just torching. You just use whale soap, all kinds of fun stuff. So um, we are going to um, hopefully enjoy the advances of science and not have to do that anymore. So we kind of chatted about, you know, it took 20 years before the government realized there's a problem. But in that interim, 
it, I don't know if you have ever had the opportunity to see how bad gypsy moth can be. Um, I was on a site today because I said it's getting really, really bad in uh, Southeast Michigan that uh, a friend of mine um, had, uh, you know, 10 acres, his house is in the middle of it. It's gorgeous. But if you sat on his deck, first of all, you couldn't sit on his deck during the uh, in, infestation because the droppings were raining on the deck and you could hear it. You could hear him eating. You could actually hear, if you stop talking, you could hear there's so many caterpillars you can hear them crunching and chewing and their droppings were raining on the deck. So technically for three weeks, you couldn't even sit outside of this property. So some of the early plant health care products or control measures that they tried to use was one that we still do today. And if it's in the early stages and you see a couple egg masses, in, uh, you know, again, understanding where gypsy moth is, uh, you could do that through your extension. Uh, is it in your area or is it not? Uh, if you have one, it's almost like a bad worm. You know, if you see a bad worm and there's only one, pick them off the tree. If you see one egg mass, because that gypsy moth egg mass can actually lay anywhere from five to 600 uh, eggs are inside there, scrape it off to strike before they even hatch. Because if you can see that if that five or 600 survive and they, you know, whatever percentage of male or female and they lay eggs, you can see how fast that could get out of control. So earlier treatments were whale soap. Whaling was big back in the mid 1800s. Uh, soap suds. A lot of us still use in a more of a, a holistic approach to some plant health care. There's still a lot of horticultural oils and soaps that are designed to be um, uh, a little, maybe a little less harsh to the environment, uh, if I said that correctly. Uh, kerosene, we just seen in ammonia, uh, probably just some of the earliest ones. In one of the trial chemicals was Paris Green, which was a, car, uh, a copper arsenic. Now, can you imagine today um, in the copper, what happens, like have you ever seen a copper pipe that gets water on it, turns green? So part of that was 50% lead arsenic in copper. And there was another ingredient I can't remember. They would mix that up. It would turn green. It was nasty. And that was a chemical that they used to apply. Um, no longer available, but nonetheless, uh, there's been a lot of evolution, a lot of history, a lot of do's and don'ts. So we kind of got away from the Paris green. There was another one called London purple. Uh, some of the chemicals that we used uh, turn of the 19th century were pretty uh, pretty effective, uh, but the adverse effect was a lot more um, severe than the, the benefit. I get a kick out of this picture when we talk about the history. Uh, my boss, Rob Gordon, found this and uh, I took it. But if you look, um, horse drawn. I got some more pictures of spraying when we get back to a little bit but you got to imagine your exposure to pesticides uh, back in the day in early spray rig like this. If you have an opportunity, again, if we talk about the um, um, the legends of arboriculture, there was an arborist in there, and I, I, I apologize for forgetting his name, but he was the skinniest guy on the spray crew back in the, the early uh, Dutch elm disease days when they were using DDT, which we'll talk about because he was the skinniest guy, they could lower him down. A DDT would gather around the inlet screen and wouldn't allow water into the pump and the sprayer would slow down. So because he was the littlest guy, they lowered him into the tank. He'd take a deep breath, swim over in the tank, clean the screen and come back. He says, oh my God, they love me. They always kept a five gallon bucket of water to rinse me off when I got out. So. Again, history. I don't know how many arborists are going to jump into their spray tank, swim over there, and clean out that inlet. So, but that was common practice. Now, if you look at something like that, I'd hate to even know what they're or what they're applying with no PPE gear on whatsoever. So, again, an advancement. So now, we take a lot better care of ourselves as applicators uh, due to the history and uh, what our forefathers did and should not have been doing. 
So a little bit about, uh, a little bit more uh, from 1905 to 1940, chemical controls were really being pushed from both federal and state. They really thought the chemicals could get this under control. Again, some of the stuff, a lot was lead. Like I said, think about lead now, lead paint. Oh my God. Think about uh, arsenic. Think about some of the stuff that they used to use. Um, by the late thirties, it just, it, it wasn't working. Uh, it's, it, it's the toxicity we started seeing the, uh, the effects on animals. And then um, right around World War II is when most of the aggressive chemicals like the leads and the arsenics were being uh, discontinued. And uh, pretty much uh, World War II put a lot of that on hold. So, uh, you know, there's never a positive on, a, in a, on an event like a World War. But because of that, a lot of the compounds and the hazardous stuff they were using was put on hold. Um, there was obviously a bigger problem in the world at that time. All right. So post, again, gypsy moth is very important. And we're spending a little bit extra time on it is because it kind of led to the way we looked at. We kind of led to some of the other compounds in different directions that we take when we talk about uh, plant health care. And a lot of it is true still to today. So during the war, um, a different class of chemical was being used in Europe, um, DDT. And believe it or not, uh, during World War II, U.S. servicemen, GIs and, and women, were actually being dusted with DDT. Now, we think about that now, like if anybody would say, oh, yeah, I dust myself with DDT every day, you probably would think that... They're crazy. But the LD50 on that is so low that it was very toxic to mammals. But what happened is that it bioaccumulated. So in the food chain, one would come in contact with it, he would build up and up, then the next one would eat him, and they would build up, and so on, so on, and so on. Um, but during World War II, it saved millions and millions of lives um, because of mosquitoes and malaria and typhus. But when we got back past World War II, we found out that that compound, because of what I just stated, was a very hazardous compound. And a lot of the compounds that we apply fully or in the environment today last a week or two. And that is by design, that you don't want to be exposed to long-term chemicals for long periods of time. So the, the evolution of what we apply today in a plant health care department is designed by, by purpose. Can, you know, compared to DDT that would last indefinitely. Uh, there was a recent paper on DDT on Michigan State campus. Again, Michigan State campus goes back to the, the discovery of DDT killing the robins. Uh, a book was written called Silent Spring, uh, all based off of Michigan State. But the, the storeroom that was historically in the entomology department was tested in the cracks in the corners. 50, 60, 70 years past, they were being able to use it and they were still finding traces of it. So it was a, an amazing compound. And I know it's, it's a trick question. And I say trick question because there's a question may come up on the quiz. Is, uh, is it still available in the US? No, it's been banned for a long time. But believe it or not, other places in the world still can apply it. Let's see, any of this we need to get hold of. Now we talked about all this. Uh, so you can see at the end of the 50s, right after World War II, man, they started dropping like flies. Just think at 57, uh, being the heaviest, 2.5 million acres of forest and community lands were sprayed with DDT. And I bet you, if you found an area where that was applied, you could probably still find residuals uh, showing up in your testing. So that's what was amazing about DDT. Uh, low LD, but lasted forever and it was bioaccumulated. All right. So now we talked about the first invasive. And again, that's understanding gypsy moth in the history is very important. So let's get into the beginning of, you know, plant health care. It's kind of how we're at right now. 
you know, we went through some steps from IPM and uh, IPM was integrated pest management. Now we're kind of moving into plant health care. But what I like about the term plant health care is healthy plants resist insects and disease naturally. And we've proven that uh, time and time again in research. So my, my point of mentioning that is that we've evolved. Um, I, um, a really good friend of mine, Christian Michael Schultz, a lot of you guys may know him, a phenomenal arborist uh, working for Right Tree as a safety uh, coordinator. And uh, he's very involved in Michigan Tree Climbing Championship, and I've known him for years. And I had an opportunity to ask him about plant health care. He's like, oh, I don't talk about it. I don't like what happens. There's too many chemicals. You're killing the earth. And um, after I talked to uh, Christian about the evolution, because when he was in an early stages of his career, he had a, 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 a unfortunate experience with maybe a, an employer or an employee or something. And he wasn't comfortable with the way um, chemistry was handled and applied. So he had always had this negative stereotype of the plant health care industry. And I will say that from when I started in the late 80s to the way we handle insects and disease management today is extremely, extremely different. So I just want to say thank you for um, Christian for pointing that out, that my vision of it, because I have evolved with it, was different than what a lot of the industry had thought. So we're going to get into plant health here. We're going to kind of get into how we got to where we are and some other cool insects and diseases. And uh, we'll keep moving. So it goes back to, again, God, guys like John Davy. The Davy Institute, DITS, is an amazing organization that continues research in finding the, the best management practices for this industry. Now, what's amazing that resonates today is that when John Davies' motto was do it right or not at all, is another one of those, you can't know a tree until you touch a tree. Just one of those things that do it right or not at all. You know, and he was, he, 1902, he wrote the book, The Tree Doctor. And if maybe one day there'll be a, a way that we can scan that and it can be available. But a lot of the terms that were used back then are still current today. Um, the man, the, the tree man about town. Uh, and that's how he, he grew. People trusted him, did the right thing. Um, some of the early practices, uh, I think a lot of these we don't do anymore, like uh, cavity filling, um, water tubes, bark tracing. Uh, but the early practices were the prelude to a lot of the research to see exactly what do we need to do, what's effective, and what's not. Um, I was uh, at Michigan Tree Climbing Championship a couple weekends ago. Um, we had uh, the Michigan Arbor Fest, which is a couple of days of education. We actually found a tree on Belle Isle that still had uh, cement cavity filling. It was actually pretty amazing to see in the art, in the, 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 the pride that people had back in the day when they did that with the steel re-rod, the cement. It was gorgeous. It was a work of art. So um, if you've ever, I, I'm pretty sure we, I, I mean, it, the research has shown that it's Mother Nature's pretty much can handle it on her own. But I really, really wish um, that some of that art can come back only because I love it. Not that it was uh, pro or con for the tree. Uh, well, maybe a different compound because the hard thing with cavity filling with concrete, and some of you guys may have known that it, one day you're going to hit that with a chainsaw. And I've wrecked many a saws uh, with either concrete or steel rods or bolts in trees. Another pioneer, uh, Francis A. Bartlett. So what's nice with Bartlett is that, again, these are, these are pioneers that started this. Um, and Bartlett's still a wonderful, great company with a research department, their lab down in North Carolina. Um, the scientific way, and they still stand um, they stand behind that. There's a lot of stuff, like I said, 1910, eye bolts and cables support weak crotches. Now, I know there's a lot of dynamic cabling systems that are out there now, 
But if it wasn't for some of the early plant health care, and I believe Cavern's part of plant health care because you're preserving the tree um, without all this. Uh, first gas powered spray rig, it's pretty cool stuff. First company to use climbing ropes. I think um, I'm going to make a note. That's one of the things we need to discuss the evolution of climbing ropes in the history. And in, uh, in 1920, designed the first fertilizer for trees. And that's pretty cool. Um, they found through research that in urban settings, trees were lacking A, B, or C. So they designed the first tree fertilizer. Now, the application tools may be a little bit different. Um, I know a lot of the early stage uh, application tools for fertilizer was uh, vertical mulching or vertical fertilizer, where they had pneumatic drills plunge a hole in a grid pattern underneath the tree to the drip line, and they would pour a, a, a granular fertilizer in, which is pretty cool. And even that device, um, which I have one of the very first, is called the Irish Arrow Furt Gun, which was designed and patented by Chaz F. Irish right around that same time, that used high pressure air to not only aerate the soil, but it had a hopper on the top that you would preload with your granular fertilizer. So you would hit the charge handle, drop that into the air tank, hit another handle, the ground would jump off the ground and it would blow a uh, granulate fertilizer into the micro and macro airports. So air fracturing of soil has been around for a while. So it goes back to the 1920s, uh, understanding that compacted soils were an issue. So. Thank you, Bartlett Company, for uh, leading the way on that. And there's been a lot of research since then that you can discover by um, reading journals and stuff on what uh, you can do to, on, uh, to eliminate compaction in soils. You know, and then you think about, let's go back a little bit of history. So as we're going to go through it, I got to think though, there was some, from 1900 till today, there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of world issues, um, world wars, the Great Depression. You know, think about it. We talk about that in the legends of arbor culture. Transportation. Think about that. We talked about the horses on campus. This is before Ford came up with the Model T. Uh, equipment to be developed. Can any, you know, you think about, Chainsaws. Chainsaws revolutionized what we do. Now, it goes back to, obviously, um, axes. If you think about the early days, everybody had axes, meat cleavers, chisels, um, development of the handsaw. Um, Fano Works has been in California for a, maybe 100 years now. But after World War II, a lot of our, our servicemen that were over there were the, the the German Panzer tank all had a chainsaw on it. So the steel chainsaw was on every tank. And the, the, the American servicemen were like, oh my God, what is that? So somehow some of them made them back. And then there's a lot of um, real quick engineering. Uh, one of the coolest saws that I have in the collection is actually a um, uh, Henry Diston, which was a big carpenter company with hand saws teamed up with Mercury boat motors and they put a saw together uh, for the military for World War II. I have one and I have the original case for it. Uh, it was amazing. And what's even more amazing is that this is one of my um, books in my collection, The History of Chainsaws. They talk about that saw in here. And because it was such high tech at the time that the owner's manual for that Henry Diston Mercury chainsaw was how to destroy it before enemy hands could get to it. Another teaser for the next history class. Do you still have but, that one in your roster? Uh, that one is actually in my warehouse because my, my garage, I ran out of room. Um, I know if I turned the camera around, you guys would be appalled by all this stuff. Uh, I was telling Kale that even right on the backside of my camera, uh, 
is Michigan State University's racing saw for their um, conclave, which I tune for them. So the, I'll, I'll grab it and I'll bring it over and I'll show you guys. But um, hand saws, if you've never cut a log with a double buck two man misery whip, you got to treat, you got to do it to appreciate what we have today. In World War II, was a change of how we, the tools that we had at our disposal. I got pictures of that chainsaw being roped up into a tree. Now you think about the Dutch elm disease, um, which we'll kind of get into a little bit. Chainsaws were getting in there. Elms were big trees. So what they do? They either went up there with a two-man misery whip and pieced it down or an ax, or they found ways to elevate that two-man saw in a cradle with a rope to the canopy to run. So I got some cool pictures of that. So that would be, that's another teaser for uh, the next history class. But World War II, transportation. One of the biggest things that I've seen in my 30, 40 years is the science in the evolution of chemistries that we put into trees. Um, the way that we can test compounds in trees is phenomenal. So now we can put uh, soil applied, foliar applied, however you want to put it, we can test tissue to test if that product made into the tree. Um, Emerald ash borer, we're not going to talk much about it because technically it's, 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 it's going to be history one day. But emerald ash borer really pushed a lot of research science into the chemistries that we infuse in the trees. Um, and that's kind of what I've been very fortunate to be part of is to see that not everything that we stem inject in trees goes from the injection site to the canopy. And that was one of the biggest advances in arbor culture in my last 20 years is to see that we can design compounds that do just that. And that's huge. Uh, and again, training. Um, I know that there's still holes in training opportunities. Um, a lot of guys that are involved with ISA and TCIA have a wonderful resource of training. Um, but what percentage of arbor culture, urban forestry have access to that? And that was my question recently to ISA. Out of all the guys that are doing tree work out there, how many of them are part of that? How do we reach more? How do we make it more safe? How do we show um, the world or everybody out there that there are advances? We've learned through the history of this industry what to do and what not to do. And uh, if we can find a better way to reach everybody, maybe we'll save lives. And that's safety is what it's all about. Here's a couple cool pictures. Um, I believe these are through the Davy um, archives. You can kind of see that the guys on the one side are setting up in a cavity. They're probably going to get ready to start rotting that. And then they'll probably do some gorgeous uh, tuck pointing with mortar. And I've seen some amazing, amazing work with that. Now, if you look at it, you've got a handsaw down there and those guys just stacked up in there. They're probably doing a cavity fill. Stop for a photograph. You know, they're starting, looks like they're starting to put like a, a scaffolding around it. Um, that's pretty cool. Now, if you go over to the, the other photograph, now you got guys, this goes back to the early days of Dutch elm disease and bark tracing. Now, I'm not sure how many people still do that, but in theory, it makes a lot of sense still today that by exposing the vascular system, the tree's response is to wall that off and if it, the tree was healthy enough, it could probably wall that off. So as I said, I don't want to get too deep into it because I don't want to, you know, mess up on my, my verbiage, but there's a lot of science and I've seen it happen in trees back 30 years ago when I was still climbing that we did that and slowed the spread of Dutch elm disease in conjunction with some of the compounds that we used back then. Um, and again, evolution, history, what worked, what didn't work. Oh, this guy, this worked great. Got around, go to an ISA conference. They talked about what worked on our elm trees. Now you know, you go out there and you're practicing. History, fantastic stuff. Uh, now, do you have um, 
Do you have any idea when we stop wearing suits and ties to go out and do our <laughs> did, did, did everybody get to hear that question or just me? No, everybody heard it. Uh, you know what, Ken? I brought that up this year at the I have a an amazing picture that used to hang on Jim Skira's uh the past executive director of ISA's wall. And it was a National Shade Tree Conference in 1940, just before Pearl Harbor on Belle Isle. And everybody there was in a suit and tie. I, you know what? That is a phenomenon. I've been doing, I've been going to tree care conferences. Oh my God. Early nineties. And I don't think other than maybe a gala that people are dressed up. So I brought that up to Michigan. And um, I think what we're going to do uh, to bring back tradition is that our, one of our, during our major event, we're going to have one night that's going to be a black tie event. You know what? I'm I'm very proud to be part of arbor culture, and I'm very proud of the arborists that serve it. And I want them to be proud because this is a this is a um, this is a, a a pretty important industry that we we serve. And it's not just a job; it's a calling. And um, I think if we spruce it up a little bit, I think it's a good thing. But great question. I don't know. That's a good one. I didn't even think I, I didn't even know I made it funny, but um, yeah. So I you know what when I present at these conferences, I do wear a sport coat. I try to, um, I try, and I hope that uh, it's not taken that I'm being disrespectful or anything. I just I love this industry. I'm going to pick it up a little bit. That's all. All right, some more cool pictures. Now, I have. If you look at the picture uh, with the guy bent over grinding a stump. I have one of those. And can you imagine the guys out there today grinding a stump like that? I don't think so. So history had shown that this guy probably hurt his back and he was sore after every day, back surgery, that that is not the way to spend three hours bent over with a lawnmower engine in a cutting wheel on the bottom. Now, did it work? Sure did. Um, is there better ways to do it? Yep. And, uh, I don't think they're in production anymore. Uh, I know, I know Rako has one that you stand behind and it's pretty sweet. Um, but history, uh, look at the, uh, the, the mall chainsaw and the other pictures. Chainsaws evolved. Um, the neat thing about chainsaws is that in 1959, and I don't know if you can see it behind me. Um, that's a big ass saw. You know, that's designed because of the weight for two guys. And the horsepower is probably four, five, six horsepower compared to today's saw with half the weight. Um, but if you can look up, pan out and just show my background. I think there's a saw back there I want to put my finger on. Now, if you look up this way to that saw right there, that is a 1959 steel Contra. That saw was shipped to me to put on display in the museum from Germany. That was the year that Andreas Steel created the reed valve. So everybody's like, what's reed valve? Pre-1959, a lot of the chainsaws could not turn sideways because the float bowl would leak out of gas and the engine would stall. He created a way that instead of having to turn, to keep the power head straight, and turned the blade, which was there's, a, there's always a, like a gearbox. That was the saw that changed it all for us as we do it today. There's a reed valve between the carburetor and the intake manifold that now that saw can, in the dangly little inlet that can flip any which way the saw is, could actually cut upside down. That was one of the biggest revolutions in 1959 that changed the way we cut wood. And uh, I happened to get one shipped to me right from Germany. So that will be display someday for everybody to pick up and hang on to. Yeah. All right. Next. All right. Another important pest. Um, again, this is a small world. We have to keep an eye on this. Again, this happened in the 30s. 
Um, but it's no different than emerald ash borer. Somehow, these insects are going from continent to continent. And why it's such an interesting uh, facet of history is that we're finding out that there's not a lot of predators in other continents where these, these uh, insects and diseases that evolved together with uh, the flora and fauna in that continent, when they get transported to somewhere new, that new continent can't survive or they don't have the natural defenses to fight everything off. So then you have another, boom, huge in, uh, infestation. And this one changed the face of more uh, urban forestry than it did forestry. Where gypsy moth is just the opposite still today. That's still a problem in urban forestry, but it's a bigger problem for forestry. So now this one is still running rampant in, the, in North America. Dutch elm disease. Um, Dutch elm disease was first discovered or isolated. Uh, and here's a, here's a shout out to the women of industry. Maria Beatrice Schwartz in the Netherlands was the first one to isolate in the Netherlands why elm trees were dying. Um, in 21, it was isolated. They kind of called it Dutch elm disease. Look how fast it was. You know, when you think about nine years, that's pretty quick from the Netherlands to North America. It was first discovered in the United States in Cleveland, Ohio, by Jazz F. Irish. Again, the Irish company was in business from 1907. Chaz Irish was actually friends with Henry Ford, uh, Francis Bartlett, uh, John Davy, and all those guys. And he had a tree care company too. Um, and still, as is according to the latest journals, is still claimed to be one of the most serious tree diseases in the United States. Um, it actually changed the face of modern arboriculture. So we talked about gypsy moth making jobs for um, individuals uh, in the workforce through uh, prohibition. Dutch elm disease, if you think back through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, the heydays of it, that disease right there started numerous tree care companies that are still alive today. So they had the revenue and the disease and the trees dying that their skill set was required. So one of the positives of Dutch elm disease. And again, just like gypsy moth, there was a, there was government contracts through uh, the Great Depression for employment. Um, it, it really brought arbor culture into cities, towns, universities, homes, urban forestry movement, plant more trees. Um, one of the big things that came from a plant more trees, but what came is that plant more variety of trees, which was being preached back then, but unfortunately was not being practiced back then because then we had emerald ash borer come and what was the number one tree planted in, in a lot of uh, municipalities? Ash trees. So we did it all over again. But I know that the history has proved that a multi-species urban forest is exactly what we need. And we're continuing to move forward and, and understand which trees do better, which trees to plant, which trees not to plant, and all that good stuff. Um, another great thing is uh, still used today is sanitation removal. That was big. Um, understanding root grafts came from Dutch elm disease. That even though that they were spraying trees above to keep the uh, elm bark beetle off of that, they couldn't understand why uh, elms were still dying. So the research history proved that uh, certain trees root graft and that fungus can spread from tree to tree below grade. Uh, in one of our the, the, the research and the history on Dutch elm disease has also helped with understanding uh, another a kind of um, raising and getting more um, prevalent in the Midwest is oak wilt. Exact same. You know, it's not the exact same thing or the next same fungus, but a lot of the treatment controls and the biological controls and how we manage that uh, fungal pathogen is very similar to what we do with elms. So just so you know, this was a couple years ago, and why I said that it's important for all of us to kind of keep our, um, our eyes open and be vigilant while we're out there is 
There's over, right now, over 500 invasive insects currently in the United States. And there's more coming every day. So every day we get an opportunity to pay attention to, you know, even our climbing arbors. They're the first ones that are up there face to face. Alex Shy go to know a tree is to touch a tree. Man, you're up there. You're touching. You're intimate. You should know if something don't work right. Are there exit holes? Is there a staining on the bark? Is there something? And um, what's amazing with with today's technology, we all got smartphones. Get a picture. Let somebody know. Um, find out what it is. Um, it may be one way to save your customers' trees and address something early, or um, you may be the next one that discovers an invasive insect or disease, and if you're lucky enough, they'll name it after you. So keep an eye out there. So this was um, this is kind of a, a this is kind of a funny. So because I'm a dork, tree dork, and I love just if anything's unusual, I just can't figure it out. So way back in my early um, my early Arbor Jet days, we we're doing some work out in Portland, Oregon area, and we're driving through this forest uh, near campus. And I remember yelling to uh, I can't remember who was with me, and I'm like, stop, 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 stop. He's like, what? I says, I had never seen anything like that before in my life. So at first, like, I don't know what to think of it. So uh, click one more time. Um, so, you know, the way it looked from afar, have you ever seen these, uh, the cedar apple rust gall, like uh, big gelatinous balls? They're really cool. Nasty, but they're cool. So I think, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like that before. So we run through the woods, we get up to the tree, and we found this. It was an art project. So... Okay, so uh, who cares, Joe? I saw we our Broadway. But in the woods, if you've never seen anything like this before, it piqued my curiosity enough. And the reason I say this is I stopped to investigate to make sure that it wasn't something out of the ordinary that shouldn't have been there. So always take a look. So treatment methods. Back in the day, you know, even though trunk injections been around for 400 years, and the story goes that Leonardo da Vinci, I say this all the time, um, had an orchard where he lived. Peasants were stealing his apples. So he decided to inject random trees that only he knew with arsenic to make poison apples. So if you want to steal his apples, it's your chance. Um, but as, as a treatment for insects and diseases, it's really the last... You know, there's some great companies out there that have been the, the forefront of this. But again, with the history and the research of compounds and how they move through the trees, um, it's becoming more and more of a reliable opportunity. But uh, here's, you know, we think about how we get to, no, it's okay. You know, you can jump one, Kale. If we think about how and how many different treatment opportunities there are out there, um, Bark sprays, uh, foliar sprays, uh, soil drenches, soil injects, re removal. We talked about removal as a, a, a plant and health care or a, um, a way. Then you got trunk injection. Trunk injection is coming more and more popular because it's a closed system and more and more people don't want to see you doing it. But I know there's stuff like I have a device back here. I think it's stuck to the bench. It's called a Dutch trig. So it's not just so much of the chemistry but what we apply also. I think the future and the history is gonna show that we're gonna find a way uh, to have a placebo or an elicitor to trick a tree into a response. So that's the future. And then when you, hopefully when some of you young guys retire, um, it'll be the history. So all kinds of great things, great ways to protect your urban forest out there right now. It all had to do with things that we did in the past that weren't so good and we fine tuned them all. So. A lot of great ways to uh, to your plant healthcare to address the situation today. Spraying trees. I think what's interesting about spraying trees is that a lot of the compounds we talked about residuals. A lot of the compounds that we used to spray. Now, one of the biggest, two biggest chemicals that I sprayed 30, 35 years ago was uh, malathion. That was, that was the go-to. Everybody just sprayed malathion and everything green. If it was green, you sprayed it. 
that there's you killed all the bugs in the property, that there's no bugs can survive, and nothing can affect your trees. So history shows that you can't do that because you kill off more invasive or beneficial insects than you are killing off um, harmful. So you threw that whole little microclimate off balance. So we're not available. Those those compounds are just not available anymore. Another one that was ama amazing was uh, Duraspan Pro. I remember back in the day that if you spray that, it had a it had a stout odor, and if you weren't you know, a lot of people want you to spray at 50%. And if they're, the homeowner's eyes weren't watering, this shows you the difference in uh, public perception from today and yesterday, is that if their eyes weren't water and they couldn't smell it, you were cheating them and you're spraying water. So we'd mix it heavy and we'd spray it hard and they'd be like, oh my God, yeah, usually good stuff today. Obviously, that's not the way you do it today. So um, spraying trees still has its place in arboriculture. I like the fact that it's a direct contact to an insect or a disease. Um, and you can control it. It works great. So I got some cool pictures next to talk about some of the spraying. So if you look back in the days, you know, I like the, the picture with the spray going straight up. That's the Dutch elm. That's an elm tree. That's the uh, DDT Dutch elm disease days. Now, bean sprayer, wooden tank on the back of that old model uh, T truck. I think it's but the guy's back there filling it up. But look at the guy underneath it. Not a care in the world. Spraying for the elm bark beetle. DDT raining down on top of it. Obviously, uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, slide over to another picture. Now, the old orchard sprayer. The poor horse is standing under the tree. You know, it, uh, Kale, you just mentioned about showing up at an event in a suit and tie, check out the guy spraying. He's got some class. And but, but look at the guy driving the carriage. He's underneath the tree. Yeah, you don't notice that. But, um, you know, it was effective. They were creating compounds. It was working. It looks like an orchard. So they're probably, you know, a lot of orchards have to spray anywhere from 10 to 20 times a year, depending on where they're at. So that was the beginning days, just you know, haphazardly spraying. Um, I think people got sick. They found out what they were getting sick from, and they had to do, had to eliminate that type of practice. But spraying is very important. Now, here's uh, a couple of great other examples of what we used to do back in the day: is um, the railroad herbicides. That was easier than um, that was easier than going down there and doing clearance, utility clearance. Just kill it all. Uh, but the bad thing is that a lot of that compound at this time period was actually used in um, Vietnam. You think about uh, uh, DDT, not DDT. Is it DDT? Yeah. What's the... Well, Agent Orange was a herbicide. Was it DDT? I can't remember. I'm having a brain fart. But they had a herbicide that there was a broad spectrum that they would spray and would kill. And they used it in the jungles of Vietnam to kill the vegetation so um, the enemy couldn't hide. And that was exposed to a lot of the vets over there that still continue to have issues today. So we have to be very careful about how we apply and what we apply. Now, if you look at the misting on the other picture. Was it was it 24D? 24D. 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 Great, man. Kale, you're smart. Yes, 24D. <laughs> that was 24D was... To stand up. Yeah, 24D. Thank you. Um, that was what they used. It was a vegetation killer to that they broadcast through aircraft to kill vegetation in Vietnam. And a lot of the a lot of the service men and women over there were exposed to it in large quantities. And um, you just got to be careful how we apply it in uh, its, its adverse effect. Um, the other one is the uh, the mist blower. You know, that could have been any any mosquito or anything in any municipality. I was a kid that we, you know, they used to spray for mosquitoes in my neighborhood when I was a kid at night. And they would send out a flyer to, um, hey, close your windows, we're spraying for mosquitoes. If you didn't get the flyer or read it. Oh, my son just got home, I got it. How's soccer go? What? I'll be right there. 
I can't hear you. What? He's coming over. I'm sorry, guys. It's soccer day. I gotta see if I'm wearing gloves. What's up? What? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't remember. No, you took a bath. You took a shower first. No, in my game. I don't know. It's your Okay. Um, he did not win a soccer game. And they're trying to figure out who's going to be first. Um. So back in the day, mosquito sprays, they can't do that anymore. You just can't do what we used to do anymore. So things have changed. The history has proven that it's probably not the best way. Uh, a little bit more about the streets. You know, peak of spraying, and um, that was the peak. Bean, bean sprayers came out. God, I, I remember when I started in the Pelion Healthcare, we charged by the gallon. You know, even with Malathion, we are oh, my God, we just, that's a 500-gallon spray job. Oh, that's a great spray job. Uh, you have to spray 500 gallons on a property. Uh, brush control, vegetation management. So the 50s and the 60s, post-World War II, man, we are just, we are using a lot of compounds right into the 70s. Uh, so we kind of talk, oh, here, there's 2,4-D. So in the early 70s, um, public concern on spraying pesticides was growing. And a lot came back. We're trying to figure out why our service aid, our service men and women were having issues coming back. Um, so you look at some of the, the compounds that they were using, 2,4-D. 2,4-D is still in production. It's still being used. Uh, and it's still causing issues today for some people. Uh, in the 80s, um, EPA really started crashing down on compounds that were like the lindanes and chloridanes and stuff like that, they were slowly going through this list of compounds and banning them for uh, uh, health issues. So even today, uh, working with ArborJet, it's tough to register a compound. Uh, they really want the scientific data. And I'm not just talking one or two years. They really want to know exactly what it does and what the long-term effect is. So 70s, 80s is the decline of spring. Um, here's a couple of recent pictures. Um, and the reason I kept these in here is that, you know, the kind of guys over on, you know, some of the hazards, you know, they got their Tyvek suits on, they've got their respirators. They're, they're, you know, they're trying to be professional. But the guy forgot one thing. The car is underneath the, the tree. I don't know if anybody ever sprayed trees and sprayed a homeowner's car before. That does not go over well. So I don't think that's probably the 70s, you know, maybe that's the 80s, look at the ban. I don't think that's a common practice anymore uh, because of public perception, the history of what happened through the years, and people just don't want that being done. So if you slide over to the other picture, I, I, I don't even know what to think what's going on here. Now, this isn't that old. So he's spraying something. At the same time, the guy underneath the tree is looking at him like, hey, dude, what are you doing? Um, no PPE, uh, no nothing. So we've proved through the years that the personal protective equipment that we should be using during plant health care applications is there for a purpose. Use it for all of our things. What's next? So removal is the solution. We can, we always, you know, we, when you take a, like a tree risk assessment course or you do something like that, we have to realize that there's a certain time where applying a pesticide is not the answer. And as, as history has proven and education is advanced, we know when and when not a tree should be removed. Um, I got a couple teaser pictures afterwards as we wrap up is that the equipment that we use in removal is a pretty cool subject all by itself. And saws have evolved. Um, but one of the latest saws I bought recently was uh, five pounds soak and wet as a climbing saw. So it's amazing what we can do uh, with removals. So I really don't want to spend a lot of time on removals as a solution. I just want to get you guys excited about um, uh, things that we're going to be doing in our next, next episode of History of Arboriculture with Tree Stuff. So you think about back in the day, obviously, when they were taking these trees down, 
it was forestry. But there was a time in our development as a society where a lot of us moved out into, or not out into, down into urban environments. And that's kind of when forestry went, you know, we were running parallel. Forestry kind of went this way. And if you see some of the equipment that uh, they use in forestry now, and uh, we kind of went this way a little bit. So we're still kind of run parallel because we're supposed to still doing tree work and there's still a lot of similarities. Um, there's a lot of difference in the equipments that we use. Uh, one thing in forestry that there's less um, inanimate objects, hazards that they have to worry about. But then again, the trees are bigger and they're doing uh, some of the equipment's bigger and more dangerous. So we're still our brothers and sisters uh, taking care of trees. So much respect on both sides of the fence. What's new in history? So wrap it up. I just wanted to talk about, we talked about a little bit earlier um, with my responsibility as president of the Arboriculture Society of Michigan in the Historical Society. We are in the process right now um, of developing a museum for the history of arboriculture. It's going to be in Belle Isle, which is an island uh, in the Detroit River. It's one of the newest state parks. And uh, some of the pictures right here are some of the early days, and we like 10 years ago. Hey, Kale, that saw on the bottom, that green one in the case, that's the military saw I was telling you about. So that is in that case, that's original case, World War II. Uh, no, that's the American version from Mercury Boat Motor and Henry Distant. So they had, they were sending back the um, the steel chainsaw that was on the tanks. And this was the American response that went over to Europe that was uh, sent to the GIs. It's a pretty cool saw once you see it, how heavy it is. Yeah, so we got that in the museum. But what we're developing is a, is a place on Belle Isle. It's a state park. Uh, to showcase what we do as arborists um, to the general public. Um, next slide. So here is um, here's the site. So the building on the upper upper left, the sawmill. Um, another interesting thing about the sawmill, which we're, we just got more funding, is that that was an urban wood realization. The city of Detroit Forestry, you can see it's for old forester office, which is ready to fall down on Belle Isle. Every tree that came down in the city of Detroit went here. So it wasn't a forestry sawmill, it was an urban forestry sawmill. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be the base of the new historical uh, museum to uh, showcase arboriculture. And there's kind of, kind of a picture on the inside, that mill is intact. So we're gonna have an opportunity, uh, hopefully by spring or the year after, to show the world uh, arbor culture in a totally different way. And the last, um, the last census that they got by visitors on Belle Isle, uh, for the last two years running, they have anywhere from four to five million visitors a year. So my opportunity is to showcase what myself and all of our listeners tonight and all the arborists and urban foresters around the world um, I want to show everybody what we do for a living. So that's what's happening new. Um, this is kind of the end of uh, tonight's presentation. So uh, the next slides, I think it's got all my information on it. If um, anybody wants to write anything down, uh, we're a 501c3. You're more than welcome to make a donation or send something cool in. Because um, I got one more cool thing that I'm going to leave you guys with. Uh, before we take some questions is that I was just recently given this and asked, was it part of uh, arbor culture or not? So hold on one second. All right. So at first you think because of the, uh, the, the harness and everything, and it's been cobbled together through the years. Someone thought it was a climbing harness. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what are these metal cups for? So I'm not gonna tell you my guess. I'm gonna let you guys take a peek at it. I'll spin it around, take a good look. 
Um, these harness, these things right here, metal. It's old. It's been repaired. It's got nails holding together, rivets, um, chain. Hmm. I don't know. We're gonna find out though. It's gonna be cool. So, uh, send me uh, your send me your guesses, and if uh, someone gets it right, which I think it is, I'll make sure you guys get a little uh, Armor Jet Joe care package. Ooh. In, does, does that uh, include a vintage flamethrower? I don't got one of those yet, but that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> I'm sure we can make one. Yeah, we've got a couple, uh, a couple on that already. Okay. Uh, uh, Tara Costanzo is asking, "Is it for a horse?" I believe so, and I think the metal cups are blinders because there's little notches in there. So, uh, but how it goes on the horse, I'm not sure. And where that circular round harness that goes is to go underneath because it doesn't look like it stretches far enough to be on the chest where I thought it would be but I think it might be I might I think it may be equestrian I think you're right but I think it's part of logging equestrian possibly hauling logs uh, hook it up to a Ooh. horse and drag it out of the forest skidding um, logs because the horse was subject to a lot of adverse things bumping into trees and so yeah that's what we think um that's a good guess. Yeah, that's a pretty good guess. Uh, John Marco was wondering if it was for spurless ascent somehow. Uh -oh. No, but you know what I'm thinking? All right, holy macaroni. All right, hey, go ahead. Let's go back to that early spray rig. Early spray rig. Uh, that, uh, that one slide I had, the early spray rig. Uh, are we talking about this one? No, back farther. It's a horse-drawn spray rig. Oh, uh, the one that you said you have? Here okay. You. Yeah. Zoom in on that horse's head. That's a good idea. I just spotted it. Doesn't that cup look familiar? Are you saying up here? Right on his eye. Oh, on his, his eye. eye right there. Yeah. Oh, not so he, he's not getting stuck with uh, sticks, sticks in his and eye. branches. That's the first time I remember seeing that up close that it looks like that could be part of it. Interesting. Ooh. Super cool. So yeah, a logging horse apparatus I made it to the museum. Is that not cool or what? That's pretty darn neat. Yeah. Um, how can people donate uh, or uh, go to, I, I assume you have a website for this? Yep, it's the ASM uh, dash foundation.org or contact me directly and I can send them the link or I can give you the link to post we got a yep. website we have uh, we got a website we got a real nice Facebook page that we uh, in the in, uh, LinkedIn page I don't think um, I don't think we uh, update that often enough but uh, yeah artifacts uh, we're a 501c3 if you have a value we'll write you a receipt or if you want to donate it, or I, I can't wait to have the opportunity to have events there to have um, our listeners come, you know, walk through and put their hand on it. So, yeah, there is a tab through our website that donations can be made. Cool. Um, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you done with your? Uh... Yeah, that was it. I was. Okay. Uh, so it was kind of. Like I said. I, I thought we said we're supposed to be done at seven thirty, but I kind of ran over. That's fine. Um, I'll just. I've, I've got a few questions for myself. Um, you mentioned uh, fertilizers a little bit um, at, at the very beginning of them. Is there anything interesting in how fertilizers have changed over time? Um, there's there, obviously there's various ways to apply. Have changed. Volumes have changed. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy on theory, um, depending on what side of the fence you are. Now, trees need um, a wide variety of percentage of macro and micronutrients for to to be as strong as they possibly can. Now, a lot of trees that we plant, we obviously break up the nutrient cycle um, by depleting the nutrient cycle. You don't have the life in the soil 
to break down the exudates and all that stuff, to release parent materials, elements. So there's a lot of people saying that traditional fertilizers, as valuable they are as the, to the industry, um, in between applying soil amendments that boost soil biology may be a direction in the future that we really need to study more on. So yeah, a trees, uh, a lot of the fertilizers that we pl- apply today are obviously chelated to be readily available to the plant. Um, a chlorotic tree does need something, but in the long term, uh, do we need to start looking at more soil health than just the lack of NPK? But yeah, there's a lot of research on that right now. Do you have any cool tools from uh, any of those fertilization tools? I know you had a, a photo of, of an old one, it looked like, earlier. Um, you know, I do, not here. Uh, I got the Aero Fert gun. They're going to throw them away. Oh, my God, they're a patented item. I got from the 30s and 40s. Um, I just picked up from Michigan State, gave me their, um, oh, my God, where's that soil thing that blows the air up? It's not the... Um, it's kind of the predecessor to uh, your air excavation tools today, uh, like the air knife or air spade. But before that, there were other air tools, um, not the soil. But again, it charges up the air. You stand on it and it blows you up in the air. No soil fractures. But <laughs> we got a couple of those. Um, I haven't had the nerve to hook them up to the compressor yet. But um I may do that and videotape it just to see some of the old practices. I, I do have a, an old pneumatic drill with the soil augers that they used to do for vertical mulching. Um, again, all designed to create more um, micro and macro air spaces for air exchange uh, and water movement through the soil. Okay. Um, uh, Jason Dudek is wondering where he can get one of the uh, Arbor Jet chairs there. Well, <laughs> you'd have to contact me offline on that one. <laughs> um, I think I got the last two, but man, are they comfy. Uh, Chad Delzell is saying uh, that you might be talking about the Grow Gun out of Britain. Uh, it's not the... Is it the Grow Gun? It's not out of Britain. It's out of Arizona. It, it might be the Grow Gun, but that was out of Arizona. There was another Terra lift. Mm-hmm. Also, but the grow gun, yes, I got two of them, two different models. Um, it's sitting, it's sitting in the trailer. I should go look real quick. But the grow gun was again, I think what happened it was just so violent the way that it moved the earth. Um, but it was effective. Uh, and a lot of guys got scared because, again, like the arrow air Irish vert gun, there was a hopper where you put uh, guys were putting vermiculite in there and other things to create gravel, but. Um, if it didn't go off right away, you got this charged device with all this gravel. And I think one guy got rushed to the hospital on campus, so they stopped using it. Hmm. Now I got it. Now I get to play with it. So we'll see. Um, let's, uh, Tara Costanzo is asking uh, what you would rename the gypsy moth. Um, says the Entomological Society of America has a committee working on that. If you had the opportunity, what would you submit as an option? Big pain in the ass. <laughs> you know what? It's uh, I didn't I, I didn't put some thought on that. I understand why they called it the gypsy moth because it's just kind of vagabond, just kind of mm-hmm. open away. But um, that's a great question. It's uh, 150 years later, 153 years later, it's still wreaking havoc. Um, and I don't know. I'm, you know, obviously, pain in the ass is a smart ass answer, but. Um, it's amazing that how how devastating it still is. The mm-hmm. gypsy moth just seems to be perfect. It's just kind of vacant. It's just a wandering around aimlessly, looking for the next tree to kill. Go. Um. Let's see. All right. I don't think I have any other questions right now. Uh, do you have anything else? You can show us just right at the end here. End here, the vagabond moth. That's a great idea. Yep. Vagabond. I like that. Um, oh, do you want to grab the Michigan State Racing? Yeah, show? yeah. Let's look at that. All right, all right. 
Keep them entertained for a minute, Kale. Oh, boy. Everything's Michigan State about him. Well, that's where I live. <laughs> I do. I do. I did a lot with uh, Ohio State, too. Mm-hmm. But I'm a Midwest guy. Yep. All right. I just don't want to cut my finger off. Well, you probably shouldn't turn it on. Well, no, it's not a gas one. It's the racing two man bucks, though. Uh, right. While you're doing that, Jeremy LeClaire, uh, in regards to arborists being updated in the new practices and science, uh, oh, uh, there, sh- uh, there should be a series by ISA or whomever that could possibly discuss the top 10 new discoveries in tree care in the past five years. Um, how to hold. Oh. You know what? That is a great point. And I think. I think that would be a great recommendation to ISA, TCIA's education committee. But you're right. Um, when I when I do education seminars on plant health care, a lot of uh, new arborists getting into the trade are kind of intimidated. But regionally, geographically, the 95% of everything that you're going to do on a day-to-day basis is five insects or diseases. Mm-hmm. So understanding what's active locally, I think it comes to funding. Michigan, Ohio, Indiana used to have these crop advisory reports that come out monthly about degree days, what's going to happen, what's coming up, what bug to look for, what's on what plant. I just don't see that stuff anymore. And God, they were so valuable to me in my early days of of uh, arbor culture. And this is pre-internet. This is this is pre messenger. Do you remember messenger before Facebook? Mm-hmm. This is way back there that you actually got a mailing in the mail. That was, you sat down and read it. You, you, they, they told you what they're researching on, what they're looking at, and what's, a, what's coming our way. Um, I think that's, um, that's kind of why uh, Corey Lofi and myself started the discovering forestry podcast. Uh, and if you guys haven't had an opportunity to, to look at that, it's on Spotify and April podcast and it's called discovering forestry. Uh, Corey and I have been doing it for a year. We, we have a new episode drop every Monday. Um, in the last one, it was about, uh, arbor culture and animal incidents. How many times have you guys been attacked by bees in a tree and stuff like that? <laughs> but, um, I think it's a great idea. And I do think that we're missing the, the, the connecting the dots of making sure that regionally, you know, I, I say arborists in general, but just tree care practitioners. Um, there's got to be aware for they can go to yep. um, to stay current. Yeah, uh, that's I, I, you know, not to not to plug tree stuff or anything, but that's definitely something we've been trying to do. But yeah, we are limited because uh, Nick and I are not plant health care experts in that. So we we've been working on the uh, on education for pretty much everything else but yeah. yeah but you guys do good like i said the other day you had uh lindsey purcell what a what a resource he was awesome mm-hmm. that tree that tree when to prune trees was a great class yeah um i know that even after uh, almost 40 years in the business i know that i still have to be a steward of education i still have to update myself i think i've forgot more tree latin names than i can shake a stick at <laughs> but I continue to, to study and I continue to read and I continue to question myself when I drive down the road or what type of tree that is from afar. And um, I try to get my wife excited about that. And she finally told me, I don't care. <laughs> so um, at least I got my young kids are excited about it, but yeah, it's just, I think it's a desire to find the answer. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why I put the picture of the thinker. If you think there's something out there, Take five minutes, Google it. Yep. You know, it's out there. There's so much information out there. But yeah, ISA, TCIA needs to do a little bit better job reaching the masses, I think. And as good as they do, maybe there's one step we could do to help them get that much better. Yeah. All right, this saw. Yeah. So this is a um, two-man buck saw. This is the saw that is uh, used for Michigan State Forestry Club to compete na- nationally. So this is a modern replicate of what our forefathers used. This saw is probably 20 pounds, razor sharp. 
and when you cut with it, it just whistles. Um, a lot different than the saw that they're going to find at a garage sale or um, grandpa's farm. But this thing is polished, uh, smooth. The teeth are set to within a thousandth of an inch. Um, when we got this, uh, when I started tuning it, they've had teeth that were almost 30 thousandths off. And you think about these cuts going through the kerf. And if there's teeth are not on, they rub on the side of the kerf and it stops the saw in its tracks. Mm -hmm. So we have a large granite table that we set this on and we tune this to as close to dead nuts accurate as we possibly can to eliminate resistance uh, when they cut. And That's this is actually tuned to cut hardwoods. So which is a difference. Um, you got a hardwood saw and a softwood saw because you can be more aggressive on a hardwood saw because the, the, the xylem is a lot harder. The hardwood's rock solid. Uh, this saw right here does not cut through pine or poplar to save your ass. It's just hmm. too aggressive for it. So Interesting. I got two saws and we tune them for whatever they're doing. What is it uh, made of? Uh, this is a stainless. Okay. Stainless steel. Um, does not rust. But again, the, but then we polish it. You can see the, the patina on it. Mm -hmm. Again, every little hairline scratch and everything actually is a resistance in the curb. So before they cut with it, we polish it. And it's things like, like a chrome. That's pretty nuts. Um, yeah, Jason, uh, I would be no good. Jason wants to know if uh, he and I can borrow it. Um, I would be no good with it. Uh, you unless know, I can you gotta try it. Though. You have to try it because I don't, you know what? I, I got, um, there's a big axe behind me that was actually one of the forestry acts for city of Chicago. You see the big axe right there? Mm-hmm. That's what City of Chicago Forestry used to use. That's that was a donation from the City of Chicago. Um, there was a time our forefathers took trees down, even in urban landscapes, with these. Okay. I mean, this is a modern version of what we use today. But um, I bring these out uh, to events to let people try them. You know, cool. You don't appreciate the saw that you got, you know, especially when your boss gives you a saw and you're like, "Oh, this is a piece of crap." Mm -hmm. Well, if he handed you this instead, you'd be happy to have that piece of crap. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we are about ready to get out of here. Thank you once again for showing us everything, um, for leading us through this. I thought it was entertaining. I think everybody else did. Uh, I have posted the uh, link to the forms where you can get the CEU by passing the quiz. Uh, you get two CEUs if you pass the quiz. Uh, uh, soon after watching this now live, if you're watching this in the future, um, you may only be able to get one CEU for it. It'll tell you when you actually go to the quiz. Um, uh, Jason, no, I cannot tell you what the next tree stuff sale is. Um, I can tell you that uh, I spent some time on Photoshop cutting a product up in, in half and making it look real cool. Um, <clears throat> so you might have to just wait to see what that is. But thank you, Joe. Um, go and check out his podcast discovering forestry uh everywhere where podcasts are podcasting um ams uh, what was that amsfoundation.com asm 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 sorry asm foundation Culture society of michigan foundation great perfect all right well thank you very much joe and hey, we, will, we will see you for the next one yeah thanks everybody for uh tuning in and spending uh, a couple hours with me